Father in heaven, we desire that you would be amongst us, that you would be with us as you always are everywhere and at every place. But Lord, we desire that your Holy Spirit would come in and teach us. Lord, teach me, uh, teach your people. Lord, we want to be centered and focused upon who you are and learn about you, Jesus. And so continue to use us as we love one another, as we worship you, as we love you. But Lord, would you come and, and soften our hearts Make a way for us to hear the truth of your word today that's just fresh and new and something that will challenge each of us as we walk out of here today in Jesus' name. Amen. So our message is entitled, Jesus, Our King. Our Jesus, Our King. It is, we are in Matthew. And we're going to start in chapter 15, verse 1, and go through verse 12. And as we get started I believe that it is impossible for us to understand or even convey through the imagination of art or poetry, music, the written word and literature. I believe it is impossible for us to describe or even adequately express or understand the humility of Jesus as he gave himself to the hands of sinful men to be judged, to be beaten, ultimately to be crucified for you and I that we might have eternal life. I believe that is beyond our ability to express in this lifetime. It was the innocent for the guilty, and it still is the innocent for the guilty as God goes before us still to this day and makes intercession for us as we fail, as we sin, as we error. God is still there for us advocating because his blood has cleansed us from all sin. You and I have to understand that when Jesus died, the innocent for the guilty, it was the key to opening the door of eternal salvation. He did it for us. It, it wasn't, he was, he was making a way for us to have a future, for us to have hope, for us to have peace and a place in the kingdom of God. So you and I then need to respond to that love. How many of you guys understand we respond to the love that God has first given to us. How many of you guys understand that? That's it. We respond to God's love for us. As we enter into our text this morning, the parallel passages of the Gospels are found in Matthew 27, Luke 23, John 18, and then here in Mark 15, as we see these trials of Jesus that are happening as he is being bound and led to be judged and then ultimately crucified. In chapter 15, verse 1, it says this, immediately in the morning. It's important that you understand why it had to be immediately in the morning. There had to be no delay. The Roman courts, the Roman authorities started at the very, very beginning of their day. And so early in the morning, immediately as the sun begins to crest, as dawn starts, that says that the chief priests had a consultation with the elders, the scribes, and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away to deliver him to Pilate. Remember what happened the night before? Judas came and kissed Jesus to betray him in the garden. He was taken by force, first of all, to Annas, the high priest. And then Annas took him to a quasi court. It was an illegal court at night with not all of the council, because this says all the council was there at this point, of the Sanhedrin, where they bring, they bring false witnesses and they tried to accuse him of awful things. And ultimately, he says, look, I am the Christ. He, he admits that. And they say, well, then we don't need our witnesses. We don't need these guys. You've heard the blasphemy. He says he's the Christ. And so now, first thing in the morning, they have to have a legal trial in order to take him to Pilate to ask Pilate to put him to death because they can't do that from an illegal trial. The Roman, Romans would have nothing to do with that. 
And so now they get together and the official trial before the Sanhedrin happens and they bind Jesus and they lead him away to Pilate. Now, there's something that I would like you to write in your notes this morning. And it's the first point I want you to take home. And it's this, is that our Jesus, our King, cannot be bound. Our God cannot be bound. He cannot be put in a box. He cannot be tied up. He cannot be destroyed. Our Jesus, our King, is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Savior. He is the Almighty One. You can't bind God. But here's the sub point. Is that our Jesus, our King, allowed himself. He allowed himself to be bound for us. He allowed himself to be given over into the hands of sinful men, to be judged by them so you and I can have some hope. See, you and I come to church, and we come to church in process. How many of you guys have figured it out that you are not perfect yet? Anybody in the room perfect? We have a place for you. You're not perfect. We are all in this process. We come to church and have hope because the unbindable God was allowed allowed himself to be bound for our sin. The unbindable God was willing to be bound for you and I, that you and I can come to church and have hope, that we can come into this place when we still have questions. You and I can come here when we still have things that we're trying to figure out. We don't have it all figured out. We don't have it all together. We are learning as we are growing. And by the way, if you're in this room and you think you have it all figured out, and you're judging the people around you that you feel don't have it figured out as well as you do, then you don't have it figured out at all. Because we're not supposed to be doing that to each other. We're not supposed to be judging one another, looking down our noses at one another like, oh, well, they're just not as good of a Christian as I am. Oh, goodness, don't do that. Because the moment you do that, you're proving to yourself that you're not perfect either. How many of you in this room right now have questions about faith in God? How many of you didn't raise your hand and still have questions about your faith with God? That's usually the rest of the room. That's your your opportunity to be honest, bunch of liars. But we do. Come on, guys. We have questions. There's horrible stuff in this world, isn't there? We see stuff, come on, don't we all go, God, why did you let that happen? Did you know that when you read the Psalms that you see that in the psalmist cry? The honesty of the Psalms answering back to God where they're just like, God, what is up? What is going on? Why did that happen? Why did this person die? Why is there just this disease? Why is there such great conflict in the world? I asked God yesterday, God, why am I doing a funeral for a four-year-old boy? If you think for one moment that a pastor walks around like we have all the answers, we don't. We hurt. We, we, we have those things that we have to deal with just like you guys. And by the way, if you meet a pastor that acts like he has all the answers, eh, I'm a little worried about that. I'm a little concerned. Because pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. We come into this place in humility because the great God of the universe humbled himself for us. And we come in with all of our questions. We come in with all of our concerns. We do. We come in and we just go, God, just be with us and help us. See, we can come in and learn as we grow because Jesus already did all the hard stuff for us. Do you guys realize that? Jesus did all the hard stuff for us. He went to the cross. He took our sin. He was buried. And he rose again on the third day. And if we believe on him, we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Questions and all. Now, 
How many of you guys get this? Um, how many of you guys have ever, um, I'm going to try to figure out how to put this. Um, how many of you realize that the day you got saved, all the mess was still in your life the day you got saved? How many of you guys realize that? Right? You realize that, right? You're saved now, but you're still a mess. So let me, uh, let me put it another way. If you are here this morning and you are a drug dealer, what you laughing about like that's possible, right? Like, people are going, ooh, it's getting too real. That scares me that you guys are like, that's just too real. All right? No, listen. Okay, let me sorry. If you're here this morning and you're a drug dealer and you're out drugs in your car and stuff, and I pray you get saved today. I pray you get radically saved today. I pray that you get so radically saved that, you know what, Kanye going to look at you and go, that man's real. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what I'm hoping, right? I hope you get so radically saved that you change the world. But you understand, you get saved in here, you still walk out, there's still drugs in your car. You have to deal with that. Do you realize that all of us, when we give our life to Jesus, we still got messed up stuff in our life. And we got to go clean it out. And sometimes that mess comes in the form of questions or things we don't understand. But remember, the unbindable God was bound for you. And he did all the hard stuff so you can come into his presence and he can say, I'm going to take you as you are that you can learn and grow with me. And that's our relationship with Jesus. Now, there's another thing about the binding of Jesus I want to share with you about this. Is that um, if you think you can bind Jesus, you wrong. Send me, send me letters about my grammar later. That's fine. I just want to make sure you understand. You are wrong if you think you can bind Jesus. If you think that you can have a view of God where you can take God and you can bind him up and tie him up and tuck him up to the point where you control Jesus, where you can, Jesus was going to let you do all that sinful stuff that, that you like to do, so you've, make, you've taken Jesus and you've bound him up and say, well, Jesus works for me as long as he works within my sin. And so I'm just, I got my Jesus bound. I got him in my pocket. Let me tell you something. That is a, that's an idol. That's not God because God cannot be bound. And he cannot be bound by you, and he will not be bound by your sin. Okay? Yeah, amen. That's not, that's not going to happen. So you cannot bind God. You can't make God work for you. You have to be what he desires for you to be as you follow him, the king, and our savior, Jesus. Now, now the readers in this Roman context would have understood what uh, Mark is writing because they would have understood the idea of what's going on as far as the court goes. See, the word was out that Jesus had been taken by night. And so early in the morning, they had to take him quickly to Pilate to get the court case started. The Jewish leaders felt that they could have a favorable, a favorable outcome from Pilate. Um, but the secular history shows that, you know what, just understand something about Pilate. He was cruel and he was ruthless. And so they're thinking this cruel, ruthless man is going to come out against Jesus and kind of lean uh, in their favor. But there's a thing about Pilate that we also learn from history is that Pilate didn't like the Jews. Pilate didn't like the Jews. He thought that they were a stubborn and a rebellious people. They kind of viewed, he viewed the Jews the way God often viewed the Jews for, through the prophets. They were stiff-necked and rebellious people. And so he was always suspicious of the Jews. And when they brought a prisoner to be put to death, a capital punishment, he's going to look at them and try and figure out what that hidden agenda is. And so before Pilate can make the decision, he has to go through the process. He has to go through the legal process that Rome has put in place where there's the plaintiff and there's the accused and there, he's the magistrate and there's the witnesses for the accused. There's the words of the plaintiff and he listens to all this and then he makes a decision and that decision, that, that sentence is carried out immediately at the end of all of this. And so I want you to realize as we look at this that you can see Pilate stalling. You can see him trying to find a way to not do this to Jesus because ultimately Jesus is innocent. 
And so what happens is the Jews come and they say to him, they say, hey, this man has made himself a king. He has said, hey, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, and he's, he's, he's built up some riots. And that's kind of the argument that they have. Well, why is that the argument? Because they're upset because he's made himself out to be God. See, if they would have brought to Pilate, hey, Jesus is making himself out to be God, Pilate would say, so what? Do you know why? Because the Romans, the Romans, the Romans, the Romans. Wow, you know, it's like, it's okay. So let me try this again. See, the Romans had taken over the Greek culture and had received all of those gods into their culture, plus their other gods. And so they were a polytheistic culture. And so this man claims to be God. He'd be like, mm, well, he can get in line. It's not a big deal. So what they did is they went after it differently. They basically come after it saying, look, this man is bringing an insurrection against your boss, Caesar. So that's the implication that they're coming with. And so in verse 2, then Pilate asked Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said to him, it is as you say. Now, please understand, this is a not yes answer. (laughs) He didn't just say yes. He just says, well, it's as you say. So there's more information that's needed for Pilate. It's, it's like, it's, it's as you say. And Jesus, at this point, we learn something about him that you and I need to realize. You and I need to realize this. Our Jesus, our king, is not an earthly king. Our Jesus, our king, is the king of kings. He's the heavenly king. He's the almighty king. That's who he is. And we need to remember that because when we remember that, that he is the eternal king forever, it helps us understand where we put our loyalty. Where is our loyalty as followers of the king of kings? Where is our loyalty to Jesus, our king? Are we given over completely to him? How many of you know that you've you've watched watched that old movie where there's knights involved and they come before the king and they get down on one knee and they clank their swords in the ground and they they give of their life and their sword unto death to the king? How many of you guys are familiar with that scene? Why is the church not doing that today? Because we don't carry swords all the time. But, but I mean, well, we do. I mean, it's just this one. But, all right. But how many of us understand that, that there is a point where he is our king? He is Jesus, but he's our king, and we need to bring our loyalty to our king, and we get on our knees, and we put our life in his hands, and we say, I follow you, or are we in a rebellion against our great loving king because we have gone off to play with another kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this world. Have we given our loyalty to the king of kings? Jesus, our king, or have we given our loyalty to the world? Which is it for us? And by the way, ironically, Jesus stands accused of doing exactly what he refused to do, which was taking a political stand against Rome. So at this moment, the chief priests, in verse 3, the chief priests accuse him of many things, but he answered nothing. So the Sanhedrin, I believe at this point, probably saw something in Pilate's mannerisms to make them think that perhaps... He did not totally buy what Jesus just said. And he's probably not buying what they're saying about him either. And so Luke chapter 23 shares with us that they begin to press in and give all false witnesses and all these other guys begin to lay out that, look, he set up riots. He he says that you're not supposed to pay taxes to Caesar, which is opposite of what he said, by the way. And he didn't have riots. He had people that were hungry that followed him that he fed, which he said, hey, make them sit down in an orderly way and let's feed them, right? You understand, he didn't, have, he didn't, he didn't start riots. He didn't, he didn't tell people not to pay their taxes. And they said, well, he fancies himself as a king and he's in political opposition to Rome. And Pilate, kind of unconvinced, but the accusers kept repeating and pressing in and strengthening their charges. Ultimately, it says in verse 5 of Luke 23, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee to this place. That This is what he's doing. 
but he's making himself out to be king. And so Pilate asked him again, speaking to Jesus, saying, do you answer nothing? Don't you answer? And he says, see how many things they testify against you. Think about all this stuff. They're testifying against you. But Jesus still answered nothing. So Pilate marveled. Why did Pilate marvel? Pilate marveled because as the magistrate in that area, there would be men pleading, groveling for their lives on a regular basis before him. And Jesus is not seeking to save his life. Jesus is seeking to give his life for you. And if you were the only person in the room, that sentence was for you. That Jesus is seeking to give his life as a ransom for many. And I love something here, by the way. Something just to remember is that Jesus did not answer the drama. All right. So here's an application point for us. Are you and I answering the drama? Or are we just not going to answer the drama? How many of you guys answer the drama? Come on, come on. I've seen some of your Facebook posts. I know. You do. You answer, you know, something comes and you answer the drama. And something happens and you answer the drama. Guys, don't, he, gee, there's all this drama going on. Jesus is silent. By the way, tells us in Isaiah 53 that he, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent. So Jesus opened out his mouth and we, we have that picture. But you have to understand, I love this because Jesus didn't answer the drama. I don't want to answer the drama. We get caught up answering the drama of this world, and the world doesn't deserve it. Don't answer the drama of the world. It's just drama. How many of you guys have ever gotten in trouble in a relationship because you answered the drama? There are not enough honest people in this room for me to continue. But let me just share. Okay, let me, let me, okay. this might get too real. Everybody take a deep breath. Okay, ladies, at times you can be dramatic. <laughs> I'm not saying the boys can't. We can be dramatic. But listen, ladies, yeah, the brother in the front row, gonna preach it. I'm like, you could get me in trouble. <laughs> but, but, but you are going to leave with him. So it's all right. But it's like, she doesn't look like she's sure. Okay, but here's the thing. Like, all of us in this room, you know, ladies, you can get a little dramatic sometimes. And let me explain what happens. It's like, and we as men feel like it's dramatic because it was a little thing, but it wasn't a little thing. It was the hundredth little thing, and you have had it with us. Okay? So now all the ladies are like, oh, now you preach it. No, no, look, look it's real. Okay? But no, but let's, let's bring it back for a second because here's the thing. Men, when our wives lose it because of the hundredth little thing that we did, that we're sure we probably shouldn't have done, and we know better, but we did it anyway, and they, they, they give us some drama, right? You have a choice. Don't answer the drama. It will be fine in 30 minutes. <laughs> or go, well, you, right? The moment a man enters into that drama, he's sleeping on the couch. <laughs> it's not 30 minutes. See, here's the thing that happens in this world around us. This world around us is full of drama. I am, I, I do, I have to, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an optimist for the most part in my life. I really am. I trust God. My God's a lot bigger than any stupid thing in this world. So in that case, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. But sometimes we get surrounded by people who are pessimists, right? You know, the half empty people. And some of you might have half empty people in your lives. See, I'm not a half full or a half empty. I'm a my cup runneth over person, okay? Mm, yeah, just that, yeah. So uh, my cup runneth over. I'm in the Lord and I'm gonna trust in the Lord. But there are times in our lives that we can get surrounded by people that are negative. And we have a tendency to get sucked into that negativity. And what happens is we begin to answer into the drama of all that negativity. How many of you guys can relate to that moment, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. Jesus didn't answer the drama. Church, we shouldn't be answering the drama. You see something online, delete it. Don't answer it. Because people are trying to suck us into a fight all the time. I'm going to tell you right now, here's the thing that I'm going to do when it comes to being online. Jesus is king. Love him forever. There you go. 
right? There you go. That's, that, that, that's the thing for a Facebook today. Jesus is king. Love him forever. That, I mean, that's it. That's what we want to do. And I want to glory. I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be all in this glum and this, this gloom and doom all the time. Jesus just didn't answer it. But there's something else that's very, very important at this moment. And this is the key point that I want to share with you. The key point that I want to share with you right now is this. Is that our Jesus, our King, does not answer to this world. This world answers to our King. This world does not answer to anything but our king. We don't answer to this world. We do not have to bow down at the altar of cultural norms. We only bow down to Jesus because he is our king. He is our Jesus, our savior, our king, and we follow him. This world will answer to Jesus. Jesus does not, will not ever answer to this world because he already gave himself to it one time. What are they going to do? Crucify him again? Just think about something. See, this world has taken Jesus to court all the time. Have you thought about that? Let's get rid of this thing and let's get rid of that thing and that's not equal and that's not tolerant. And that's not, and so the, 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 Jesus is on trial in this world that we live in. Do you understand that Jesus is coming back and he will fix it? Because he's king. Oh, you know, I, what would it be like if somebody put Jesus on trial and he showed up? Right? You see, you, you see the prosecuting attorney, well, we now call Jesus, and of course, if he doesn't show, they win the trial. We now call Jesus to the stand, and the door swings open, and there's light, and Jesus walks in and says, you want to talk? I'll talk. Because you remember, he's already been humbled. <laughs> he's already been the sacrifice. He come in and say, hey, look, you, you want to have a conversation about right and wrong? I'll have a conversation about right and wrong. See, here's the thing for us, is to remember that we follow a king that does not answer to this world. Therefore, we do not answer to this world. Philippians chapter 4 says, we are citizens of what? Heaven. Say it with me, church. We're citizens of Heaven, that's right, we're citizens of heaven. And because we're citizens of heaven, we are not accountable to the cultural norms of this world. We don't have to bow to those things. By the way, are, do we need to honor the laws of our land? Absolutely. Do we need to do the right things? Yes. Do we need to be involved in the process of our, like our political process, do we need to be involved in all those things? Yes. But ultimately in the end, I'm gonna tell you right now, people ask me all the time, so what are you? I'm like, what do you want? What, what, you need to be more specific. They're like, what, what are you? You're middle-aged and white. I assume you're and a Christian, so you must be Republican. Right? And I have this, this is, by the way, this happens all the time to me. And I look at them and I go, can I tell you a secret? And they said, yes, because they're gossipy. And I say, I'm a monarchist. And they look at me like, Sir, I, I didn't, is that a third party? Is that like the independence? What is that? I'm like, well, it's sort of independent. See, I believe in the rule of one king. He is my Jesus. He is my king. He is the one king, and he is coming back, and he's going to fix this mess that we've made. Because my king is the king of kings, and he is coming. That's my authority. My authority is the king of kings. Church, where's, our, where's your authority? I hope it's in the king of kings. Now, let me share something with you about this. I'm going to share some verses just for you to consider this. The idea that this world is accountable to Jesus. Romans 14, starting in verse 10, it says this. And he's asking the question, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? Why, you know, why do you do that? Why are you passing judgment? Why are you doing that thing? That, that's dumb. Don't do that. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. Every one of us will give our, an account of ourselves to God. That's just going to happen. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself be, and by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of on the cross, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, 
So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isaiah, oh, I love Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, 23 says, By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. This is my God. This is my king. He is the king of kings. And this world is accountable to my king. That's just the way it is. That is the scriptural truth. And you know what's interesting about when God swears? When God swears by himself, that means that is a thing that will be done. It is a one-way thing. It's not, that's not a two-way thing. So when he said to Abraham in Genesis 22, he says, look, I, I swear by myself that I'm going to, with blessings, I will bless you. Multiplying I will multiply you. I'm going to make you a great nation. And from your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That is a one-way, steel, unmovable covenant of God throughout the scriptures that ties everything together from Genesis chapter 12 through Revelation and a new heaven and a new earth because the promise of the Savior is Jesus Christ and he is the king. That's who he is. Now, at this point in our narrative, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. Herod then sends Jesus back to Pilate. And then we pick things back up in verse 6. Now at the feast, he, Pilate, was accustomed to releasing one of the prisoners to the Jewish people, whomever they requested. Now, this is important at this moment because remember what's going on in the society is that there are three times the amount of Jews as normal because it's the feast days, and there are ten times the amount of Roman soldiers in case there's some kind of insurrection or rebellion of some kind, and that's what's happening. And so at this time, it was like an annual thing for Pilate to release somebody to the Jewish people that they requested. It would be something annual for us, like, uh, okay, people live in New York, New Year's Day, ball drops, everybody goes to Times Square, right? You know, kind of a thing. It's this annual event that happens during the feast. And so they come together, and it was whoever they requested. So there was no discrimination in it. And so tell, he tells us a little something about what's going on in the background. And there was one named Barabbas, son of Abbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. Now, these guys were rebels. They're all locked up. And they committed murder in the rebellion. So there was a rebellion that, was, that they knew about, and they had committed murder. So this was a murderer that was imprisoned for murder and that means that he was there rightfully so. And the multitude cried out and cried aloud um, and began to ask him to do just what he'd always done for them. And so now this is more mob mentality. The mob is coming together. The people are crying out, hey, release somebody, release someone. More people gather. The people who have an opinion of who they want to release. Maybe it's a loved one. So could you imagine like the hordes of families that would come together to ask for the release of somebody? Maybe you had a family member that you thought was unjustly put there and you'd get all the family together at the feast and you'd ask and petition for basically a pardon. And so this is happening, and, and Pilate answered them as they began to get everything stirred up as saying, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Do you want, do you want me to release to you Jesus? And verse 10 is very, uh, very, tells us something very interesting. For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. Pilate knew. Pilate's wife had a bad dream. She came to her husband and said, don't have anything to do with this guy. And he ends up washing his hands of the whole thing. He says, look, his, hands, his blood is on your hands. And they actually cry out and say, fine, so be it. Let his blood be on our hands. It's so, it's so interesting how venomous that these religious leaders have become. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd. You see this? They stirred up the crowd. And so when they'd stirred up the crowd so that they would, he, they would rather release Barabbas to them. And so, you know, hey, ask for the murderer. Ask for the rebel and the murderer. Don't ask for Jesus. Don't ask for him. Ask for the murderer. The, the people, the religious leaders are stirring up the mob to ask for a murderer instead of the Savior. Have you noticed that this world doesn't want the Savior? They'll take the murderer any day of the week before they'll take the Savior. It's a harsh reality of the world that we live in. And by the way, I don't, I don't blame the culture for the sin that's in it. I blame sin for the sin that's in the culture. We're all sinners. And sin unchecked leads to awful places. And you know what? Without Jesus in people's lives, we shouldn't be surprised at how dark they get, how evil they get, how awful they get. 
how perverted they get. That shouldn't freak us out. They don't have God. They don't have light. They don't have hope. They don't have joy. They don't have a king. They just don't. And so the, they, they, they're asking for Barabbas. And so Pilate answered and, and said to them again, well, what then do you want me to do with, uh, with him of whom you call the king of the Jews? Who you call, which tells us he's like, yeah, I'm not buying it. Who you call the king of the Jews? What do you want me to do with him? And they cried out, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, well, why, what evil has he done? Pilate is trying to negotiate with a mob. Did you realize that? That's like trying to negotiate with a two-year-old, right, moms? That's just not going to go well. And, and, and what happens is they just cry out, and they cry out again. And it says, but they cry out all the more, crucify him. They are asking the king to be crucified. Now, this is the, one of the last points I want to share with you this morning, is this. Is that our Jesus, our king, is a hated king. People hate our king. People hate our Jesus. And there's a reason that I'm, I'm saying it like this because I want you to have a new grasp on something. This idea of what it is to follow him. If he is the hated king, will you follow him anyway? Because a lot of times we'll follow people when it's convenient and when it's easy, but as soon as it gets hard, we're throwing somebody under the bus. As teenagers, how many of you in this room, be honest with me for a second. Don't raise your hand yet. Let me, let me ask the whole question. We're in a situation where you were doing things that were quasi-questionable. No, they were questionable. And the, the, you know, the popo showed up. You know, 5-0, Leo, that law enforcement officer, shows up. How many of you at some point threw somebody under the bus to get out? Oh, raise your hands, people. Don't be doing one of these. Come on, right? Seriously, this whole section, I know some of you. That can't possibly be true. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. About time. Okay, yeah. So, but yes, yeah, like, I'm looking, I was like, he must have been taking copious notes. You know, but, but the reality is there are times that we get thrown under the bus because we're following somebody we shouldn't. How many of you have been that person? That's a larger group of people, right? We've been thrown under the bus. Do you guys understand that when we follow Jesus, we follow our Jesus as a hated king, and we follow a hated king? And as we follow a hated king, we have to ask ourselves, will we follow him anyway? Although the world hates him and the world despises us for loving him, are we still willing to follow the hated king? Because it went from Hosanna, Hosanna, to crucify him, crucify him in a week. By the way, that's what most pastors feel like in pastoral transition, by the way. Oh, yay, the new guy. Oh, we have to kill him now. I mean, that's kind of how that works. So <laughs> yeah, it's just, that's, how it, that's how it goes. And so, but here the, it's gone from Hosanna, Hosanna. Hey, he's the one who's going to save to, hey, let's kill him. By the way, it's still Hosanna because in killing him, they're bringing salvation. Just thought I'd drop that theology on you for you to chew on a little bit there. But, but here's the thing. This happens to us, too, where we have relationships and people that we know, and they find out we love God. Funny thing for me is Facebook. You know, people start to reconnect that you're in high school with, you know, through Facebook and stuff like that. And, and somebody reconnected with me on Facebook, and they say, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm a pastor. And then they unfriended me. I was like, good, less drama for me. Right? Because obviously that was going to be drama. I don't need that kind of drama. Right? I don't need that drama. They, I'm a believer. They don't want to be friends with me. That's fine. But you know what? It's like that happens to us in our culture. Like, oh, I'm being persecuted. I put something up from church and people unfriended me and I don't like it. And I'm being persecuted for my faith. No, you're not. You don't know what persecution is. We don't know what persecution is. But when we stand here as a church and say, are we willing to follow the hated king? I think the reality sets in a little bit differently. Because Matthew chapter 10, 38 says this, and whoever, desire, and whoever does not, sorry, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Will you follow me, the hated king? Matthew chapter 16, 24, and Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Will you follow the hated king? Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says this, 
and calling the crowd to him and with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And in Luke 9, 23, a parallel passage to the one in Mark, he says, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Luke 14, 27, whoever does not bear his cross, his own cross, and come after me is not worthy or cannot be my disciple. This, this idea for us of, look, the world hates Jesus, and so they're going to hate us. It's okay, because we follow a hated king, but he's the coming king. He is the victorious king. And yeah, you can celebrate that fact. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Y'all sometimes seem unsure as whether we can celebrate in church. The answer is amen. Yes, you may. Okay, so it's all right. We just, we just keep going. You know, I, I try and give space for it sometimes. Yeah, no, I don't know. It's okay. Man, you want to, look, Jesus saved you. You want to celebrate that? I, I get that. You know, I understand. Um, and so I just want to share that with you. That's an aside at this point. <laughs> but I'm already running late, so whatever. Okay, now, <clears throat> but, but here's the thing. We pick up our cross to follow Jesus. But let me ask you something. Does that mean we have to be perfect to pick it up? No, we pick it up while our lives are a mess. Does it mean we have to be sinless to pick up the cross? No, the cross deals with our sin. So we pick up the cross and follow him. Goodness, I'm not perfect, neither are you. Don't worry about it. Does that mean we're gonna, that means we're gonna trust Jesus because he saves us and then we walk with him in that process of walking with him. We grow in a relationship and yes, we have questions. Yes, we have hard questions. And you and I often live in a storm of cognitive dissonance where the things we have been taught or we see in the culture and the world around us, that voice is opposite of the voice of God. And there's always this rumbling in our mind and in our heart. And we're always trying to figure out what is it, what's happening, what's going on. And you know what? There is just stuff that happens in this world that is hard to come up with answers for. But God is still on the throne and we still follow our hated king, because our hated king is our coming king, and he's the savior of all kinds, because he went to the cross. The one who was not bindable became bound for you, declared himself to be the king, and they put him to death. They buried him, and he rose again. And when he rose again, he proved every word that he ever said to be true. Our king is alive, but our king is a hated king that is the conquering king. And I'm gonna tell you something right now. If I'm gonna go into battle, I'm gonna go in on the winning side. I might lose in a battle, but I will never lose the war because I follow the king of kings. Is there sacrifice when we pick up our cross? Absolutely. But if you've ever been made to feel that you are not good enough for the love of God or for the kingdom of heaven, you can relax. And you can come as you are with all of your questions, with all of your messes. And if you're the person with drugs in your car, get saved today. Get saved. Get right with God. And know that Jesus loves you and we love you and there is goodness in this house because God is in this house. Consider the humility of Jesus, what he did for you. And as you consider the humility of Jesus, would you humble yourself, pick up your cross and say, yes, I follow the hated king. Father in heaven, thank you for the word. And I ask that you would be with us as we come into this time of communion and worship, as we focus and meditate on you, your love, and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Water Springs Church. Check us out at watersprings.net. And if this video blessed you, please click the subscribe button. God bless.